February 1st, 2004. It had been a busy day in the United States. The Super Bowl had had its most watched game ever with nearly 90 million people tuning in to see the New England Patriots beat the Carolina Panthers in a 32-29 victory. With a halftime show starring Justin Timberlake and Janet Jackson, the events would become one of the most talked about pop culture moments of the 2000s. For many football fans, the celebrations were just beginning. But in Sarasota, Florida, it was a very different story. A massive search was underway for a missing 11-year-old girl who had vanished without a trace. The truth was about to come out. A truth so disturbing it would leave a family, a community, a police force and a country completely devastated. Carly Jane Brucher was born on the 16th of March 1992 in Long Island to parents Joe and Susan. They were divorced the following year and Carly moved to Sarasota, Florida with her mother. But she would see her family in Long Island during the winter and summer breaks, especially enjoying the Christmas period there. Susan would later remarry and welcome a son with her husband Stephen. Carly was described as energetic. Her teacher said she was lovely and delightful and her principal called her a shining light. She loved her cat Charlie, was obsessed with Jennifer Lopez, enjoyed going to the mall and hanging out with her friends. She always greeted those at Macintosh Middle School where she was in the sixth grade with a big hug and a warm smile. She sang in the chorus and enjoyed playing sports. Quite simply, she was someone who loved life. February 1st, 2004. Carly had spent the previous day with her friend and the pair had had a sleepover. At around 6.15pm, she set off back to her house just one mile away as she was due to watch the Super Bowl with her family. Her friend's mother decided to call Susan to check if it was okay for Carly to be walking home alone. Susan said she didn't want her daughter walking by the Bee Ridge Road as it could be busy and she hadn't given Carly permission to walk alone. She spoke to her husband Stephen and he drove off to pick her up. The streets were somewhat quieter as most families were gathered around the television for the Super Bowl but as Stephen drove around the streets panic was beginning to set in. He couldn't see Carly anywhere. She had gone without a trace. Just one hour later, 911 was called and Carly Brucia was reported as missing. 911, what's the location of the emergency? My, my daughter is missing. She's gone. We can't find her anywhere. I've called all her friends. How old is she? 11. And when was the last time that she was, she was seen? Oh, was it six o'clock, James? The police were dispatched and soon at Carly's house. They spoke to all of Carly's friends to see if they had seen or heard from her and knocked on neighbours' doors in the hopes that someone had information for them. They spoke to the friend whose house she had stayed at and her friend's mother and Carly was described as being a bit upset as her mother and stepdad had been arguing. She had wanted to leave early and go home to spend time with Susan. As news began to spread, the searches got bigger and the police carried on with them until three o'clock in the morning. But there was still no sign of Carly. It had soon been 12 hours since she had last been seen. As her classmates arrived at school, they were all hoping to see her there, but she didn't turn up. After she failed to make it to school, the police decided to bring in bloodhounds to see if they could trace her scent using one of her pillowcases. Ruby the bloodhound tracked her scent to behind Evie's car wash, at 4715 Bee Ridge Road. It then suddenly stopped. The police quickly sealed off the area and spoke with the owner of the car wash, Mike Evanhoff, who told them there were surveillance cameras operated by a motion sensor. Footage from one camera showed the busy main road, but an empty parking lot. Another camera from a different angle also showed them nothing. They then checked the camera at the back of the car wash, it was a camera that was triggered by movement, and as they pressed play, it showed a recording taken from 6.21pm on the evening of Carly's disappearance. It showed a young girl in a red shirt and blue jeans with a pink backpack. This was what Carly was wearing on the day she had last been seen. Then, suddenly, another person came into view. A man. The man in the video was approximately 5 foot 8, with dark hair and tattoos on his arm. 
He was wearing a mechanic's top with a name tag that was too blurry to be made out. He stopped in front of her and the pair spoke for a few seconds. He then grabbed her arm and led her away. Even though the footage was just a few seconds long, it painted a terrifying picture and it was clear to all of the officers that Carly was in grave danger. Her stepfather Stephen was asked to go down to the station to talk to the police. As soon as I said, can you go pick up Carly? She started walking down here. I just said, where's she at? She was, Connie's. I said, that's the one over here. And she said, yeah. I said, okay, I'll be right now. And I'll be the right one. Okay. He said he knew that something was wrong because Carly just did not behave this way. She was always sure to call and keep her parents in the loop as to where she was and what she was doing. Based on Stephen's phone records, he was immediately ruled out. But he did say something interesting. He said as he was driving down Bee Ridge Road looking for Carly, he had spotted a red truck that was also driving up and down too, a truck that had pulled into the car wash. He said that when he went to her friend's house, the same house that Carly had set off from, a red truck was parked outside. He was sure it was the same one he had seen earlier. The man in the footage was wearing a mechanic's uniform, something often worn by tow truck drivers. The owner of the truck, a man called Ron, lived at Carly's friend's house, and he had been there the night before. They immediately brought him in for questioning. Carly spent the night Saturday? Yes. Anything? Sunday morning? I woke up. I don't know. Nothing happened Saturday night. You know, they were giddy and all night long. You know, I was sleeping in the other room. So uh, I woke up Sunday morning, like I normally do, get up, get ready for work. So if you didn't see her at any point after... During the day? During no. the day or if you went to work? Absolutely not. Is that what you wore to work Sunday? or No, actually I had a Super Bowl shirt on yesterday. A great shirt. They showed him a photograph of Carly with the man in the car wash. Is that... I have the slightest idea, so it's definitely not me. It doesn't look like me, it doesn't so. yeah, It kind of looks like you. That's why we're talking to you. Wow. Yeah, that definitely would not be me there. Honestly. The deputies that you spoke to mm-hmm. that night think that that's you. Okay, it's not me. Blow it up. Do what you got to do. You verify my time, where I was. You know, I'm more really glad to work with you guys than anything. Believe me, there is no way for me that, that was me. Honest, uh, right, honest to God. No way at all. I would never put anybody through that. No way. Uh, how do we get past that, though? And that's, that's verifying where I was at 621. They spoke to his boss and they were able to verify that Ron had been working and his time cards also backed this up. A search was carried out of his truck but nothing was found. Ron was ruled out. But this meant they still didn't know who the man in the footage was or where he had taken Carly. They also showed the footage to Susan but she too had no idea of who he was. For the community this was alarming. As Joe said, there were people less than 300 feet away from the abduction. There were people here. It was in daylight. A reward of $25,000 was put up for any information that caught her kidnapper. The police decided to recheck the footage to see if it could give them any more clues as to who this man was. And when they rewound the footage further, they saw a pale yellow 1992 Buick Century station wagon arriving in the parking lot just three minutes before Carly was kidnapped. The Buick then drove down Bee Ridge Road and braked just outside of the car wash to turn in. This finally gave them another lead. The searches carried on and many people came out to look for her. Missing persons posters were stapled up and handed out. The community were determined to leave no stone unturned. The mayor called Carly Sarasota's child. They were not going to rest until she was found. Her mother Susan appeared at a press conference. I want to address my Carly. I love you. I have this phone on at all times. I'm begging and pleading. Please help me bring my daughter home. Her father added, Carly, if you can hear this, your mom's at home waiting for you. February 3rd, 2004. It had now been two days since Carly's abduction. A woman was watching the news and saw the footage from the car wash. She got her husband to also watch it and they were in agreement. They knew the man. He was a former business associate. She said, I worked with him at the shop so I knew what he looked like. The sneakers the way his hair was cut, the way he walked, and then when I watched him reach for the girl, I've seen him pick tools up like that, you know? I knew it was him. 
Her husband called the police and provided the man's name and address to Detective Vincent Reaver. Detective Reaver and another officer headed over to the address provided in an unmarked car and met two more police officers. A neighbour told them that someone was definitely home, so the officers knocked on the front door and waited. There was no response. One of the officers called a supervisor for advice and they discovered that the man in question was actually on probation. He had had two previous parole violations, but had not been remanded. They got in touch with his probation officer and asked her to come down to the house. Around 45 minutes went by and a woman arrived at the property. She was the man in question's sister. She agreed to get him and bring him out. Then, standing in front of them, there he was. Joseph Peter Smith, 37 years old, father of three, originally from Brooklyn. Joseph Smith had a long list of previous criminal convictions and was currently unemployed. He had at least 13 prior arrests in the States dating back to 1993. For possession of heroin and prescription drug fraud, he spent 17 months in custody. Just eight days after his release, he was arrested again for possession of cocaine and was put on probation for three years. He had also been arrested, charged and later acquitted for a charge of kidnapping and false imprisonment. He had very recently violated the terms of his probation but was released. The woman who had seen him on the news was not the first person to give the detectives this name. Of the over 800 tips they had received since releasing the footage of Carly's abduction, several other people had called in to say that they believed that this man was Joseph Smith. He drove a brown Lincoln, not a Buick station wagon that had been seen driving down Bee Ridge Road and breaking just outside of the car wash to turn in. While officers tried to trace the owner of the Buick, two detectives spoke to Joseph Smith. The officers asked him about what he had been doing on the day Carly had been abducted, asking if he had been at the car wash. He said he hadn't been. One of the officers then asked if they could look more closely at his tattoos and he asked them why they were even there and why they were talking to him. He was told they were looking at a kidnapping. He said he didn't know what they were talking about. They then showed him a photograph of the surveillance footage. That looks like me, but it's not me, he said. Joseph agreed to let the officers search his vehicle and the room he rented. He didn't appear nervous and was cooperative with the detectives. When a search of his room was conducted, they found nothing that linked him to Carly but they did find a mechanic's uniform with a name tag on the front. A search of his car was also conducted and drug paraphernalia was found, so he was arrested for violating the terms of his parole and possession of drug paraphernalia. As his brown Lincoln was being searched, one of the owners of the home he was renting a room in, a woman called Naomi, arrived at the property, driving a yellow Buick station wagon. The officers asked her if she knew anything about Joseph's whereabouts on the day Carly had last been seen. She explained that at around 6.30, Joseph had been on the phone with his estranged wife. This meant he now had an alibi. They were now back at square one, and time was running out to find Carly. But just a few hours later, more information would be brought to light. Naomi's husband, Jeff, arrived at the station. He was driving the Buick station wagon. He said that his wife had not recalled it correctly and had got the times wrong. Joe came out and said, hey, can I... Your car. I said, well, just go. I just, how are you going to be for 15 minutes? So I said, all right, go ahead. What was you wearing at the time? His um, capsule. Gray. Gray. Yep. When I got up at 6.30, no car. 7.30, I'm ready to get a wolf out the door. Who shows up? Joe. Yeah. Where the hell have you been? What do you look like 7.30 Monday morning? Girl, please. Like, he had a good night's sleep, or he's been real happy, or... But he just looked like he had a wonderful night. It, 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 it was just the way he acted, from what I know, was just very strange. And I see stuff on the news. You know something? I, I guess there was a dark side, I just never saw it. Jeff knew that something had happened in the vehicle as things had been moved around and the back seat had been put down. Jeff gave the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office the Buick for them to carry out testing and examinations. With Jeff's new information, Joe's whereabouts suddenly could not be accounted for, and they now knew he was driving the station wagon at the time. Joseph was read his Miranda rights, and he asked for an attorney. We gotta sit down and we have to talk. This room, it's not the truth. It's the most important thing that goes on in this room. Is the truth. Was there any lies to talk to a lawyer? Who lies to you? Okay, correct. That means you and I can't. We should talk to a lawyer.
On the evening of the 4th of February, Joseph's brother John arrived at the police department and was spoken to by the FBI. He said that he and Joseph were not on good terms, and that on the evening of the 1st of February, the day Carly was kidnapped, he had received a call from Joseph at around 8pm. John didn't speak to him. The following day, John and his girlfriend were watching television, and then on the news, he saw the footage of Carly's abduction. The face, the hair, the mechanic's uniform. He recognised the man straight away. His girlfriend did too. She noticed particularly the way he walked. Since having surgery on his back, Joseph's walk had changed. Later that night at around 11pm, Joseph had appeared at John's house, seemingly under the influence of some sort of substance. John allegedly refused to let his brother come inside, as he had previously ogled his girlfriend's teen daughter on various occasions. Although Joseph was in his mechanic's uniform as per usual, he wasn't wearing his usual tennis shoes, he was wearing boots, something he never wore. All Joseph would say was, you want to talk to me about something? John told him no and shut the door on him. When Joseph arrived at work the next day, he was reportedly acting strangely, repeatedly washing his hands even though they were clean. He also told his boss that he might need to go out of state, suddenly and at any time. John told the officers, I don't have any concrete evidence. It's just, it looks like him, it walks like him. The more I look at that video, the more I look at him. It's just, well, total resemblance, if it's not him. They needed Joseph to confess if they wanted any chance of finding Carly. John said that if he was responsible, he would never admit to it. He will die with that secret. If it's him, you won't get it out of him, he told the FBI. To try and gather more evidence, it was announced that the detectives were seeking the help of NASA, who could enhance the image from behind the car wash and see if they could determine what the name tag said. They were able to. It said Joe. The arrest report also said that he had manoeuvred the Buick in a premeditated manner to conceal his actions, where he was able to approach Carly. The evidence was stacking up but soon the case would take another turn. The 5th of February, 2004. Joseph spoke to his brother and mother. After an hour and a half, John came out and said Joseph came close, but he didn't say anything. Neither John nor his mother were debriefed by officers, and no surveillance was put on them after exiting the station. That evening, John called the FBI. I guess you heard. What do you want me to do? The FBI were confused. What on earth was he talking about? John thought his phone had been tapped. It hadn't been. It then clicked. Joseph had obviously called his brother and told him something about Carly, and John, believing his phone had been tapped, was now calling to give them the information. Three officers, including two FBI officers, went straight to John's property, and there, the truth would come out. John gave them directions to where she was. 6221 Proctor Road, near I-75. At 1am, in some thick underbrush in a field behind the Central Church of Christ, Carly's body was found. She was naked from the waist down, apart from a sock on her right foot. There was a deep ligature wound to her neck. The FBI officers took John back to the police department to talk to him again. He admitted that when he came out of the interview room and said that Joseph hadn't said anything, he was lying. Joseph had actually said, I'm sorry I did this to you. Their mother then left the room and Joseph carried on talking. He said that he had taken what he thought was cocaine on the day of her abduction, and everything that followed was a blur. John said it felt like he was afraid to say, you know she's dead. So I just said, okay, Joe, she's dead, fine, where is she? Where is she? We've got to find her. Where is she? After they left the station, John and his mother had gone to the church to look, but had not found anything. Joseph then told them she was in a field behind the church. John told the agents he hadn't said this before because he didn't believe what Joseph had said, and he hadn't actually confessed to killing Carly. John said he had gone as he was curious to see if anything he said was accurate. He said if he were to find Carly alive, his plan was to free her, give her money, take a photograph to sell to the media, and then use that money to hire a good lawyer for Joseph. Joseph would eventually confess to sexually assaulting her in the vehicle. He then admitted he had violently raped her. A storm was rolling in, so the decision was made to leave her body in situ overnight and move her in the morning. To stop her body from being photographed from above, the police department contacted the White House, who granted a special no-fly zone for the area. 
Her body was later examined by the Sarasota Medical Examiner, who determined that she had been dragged into the field and strangled from behind, and ligature marks on her wrists indicated she had been bound. Joseph's DNA was found in semen on her shirt, and it was later reported that the chance of having a DNA profile of a Caucasian man being selected at random that matched the sample was 1 in 32 quintillion. The evidence did not stop there. Two of her hairs were found in the Buick, and there were seven fibres found in the Buick that matched Carly's red shirt. Joseph had dumped her clothes and pink backpack in different bins, in a bid to cover his tracks. It was Sheriff Bill Borkwell that was given the task every officer dreads. He had to tell Susan. He headed over to her house and broke the news. Susan screamed, he killed my daughter, he murdered my daughter, he murdered my baby. Sheriff Bill Borkwell then had to tell the public. With his voice breaking as he spoke, he said, The body of a beautiful 11-year-old girl, Carly Yusha, has been found. Joseph Smith is under arrest for the abduction and murder of Carly. Friends, family and the local community who had searched to try and find her gathered at the church to lay flowers and pay their respects. McIntosh Middle School announced that following the news of her body being found, they were going to open up to the community and offer grief counselling for those affected. The impact of the crime was so enormous, parents were too frightened to even let their daughters walk to the mailbox. The community held a vigil outside her house, showing Carly and her family just how much they were loved and supported. We love you, Carly, was written on banners and posters. Her father, Joe, offered his thanks to all of those who had been involved. I just want to thank all of the people behind me in their efforts to find my daughter in the community that was so involved. I just want to thank everybody for all they've done. On the 9th of February, Joseph spoke to his mother and the conversation went as follows. Oh, Joe, the best thing you can do is try to explain it was an accident. But it was an accident, Mom. I know that, Joe. You don't think I would do that on purpose, Mom? No, no, I don't. I don't think so at all, Joe. Not at all. I know you better than that. But everyone is up in arms. The community, the press, the governor, the mayor. You just don't know, Joe. At a memorial service for Carly held on the 10th of February, many people arrived, including Sheriff Bill Borkwell. For everybody, this was the devastating outcome that they had hoped and prayed would not happen. On the 20th of February 2004, Joseph Peter Smith was charged with kidnapping, one count of sexual battery, and he was also indicted on a count of first-degree murder. As this was Florida, he could face a death sentence. Captain Jeff Bell said, We now stand ready to complete our obligation and assure you that he will pay the ultimate price for what he did to her. As he sat in custody awaiting trial, a letter from Joseph to his brother was intercepted. It had been written in code, which was later broken. The letter said, I wish I had something juicy to say. Oh, okay, the backpack and clothes went in four different dumpsters. I left it out in the open. I dragged the body to where it was found. Destroy this after deciphering it and shut up. Before the trial could start, Carly's grandmother passed away, with some saying she had died of a broken heart. Her grandfather left the United States and moved to Europe, where he too would later pass away. Carly's uncle would drive his truck into a tree and die as a result of his injuries. It was reported that some had said he had done this with the intention of taking his own life. A month before the trial was due to begin, Joseph's lawyer tried to have the car wash video thrown out and the confession he allegedly gave his brother in prison. The lawyer argued that the prosecution could not prove that the digital images and the time and date stamps on the video were authentic and correct, so therefore should not be used. He also argued that when the FBI got his brother to talk to him when he had already exercised his right to remain silent and asked for an attorney, this led to him being illegally interrogated. An FBI agent said that it was John who had wanted to talk to his brother to see if he would answer any questions, and only did so after the authorities were approved for the visit by Joseph's lawyers. It was now time for Joseph Smith to go on trial. The evidence was strong. The footage from the car wash. The evidence from the Buick. The fact he was driving the Buick at the time. The DNA found on her clothes. And him being able to tell them where her body was. It was a difficult and confronting trial without question. For those who had held out hope, searched for her and been there for her loved ones, it was extremely tough to sit through the details of what had happened to her. One of the people to testify was John, Joseph's brother, but this was not without its problems. 
Prosecutor Deborah Reaver asked Judge Andrew Owens to declare John as an adverse witness, also known as a hostile witness. At this point, John was facing charges for drug possession and armed robbery. It was reported that John had admitted that during his testimony, he was actually high on crack cocaine. After all of the evidence had been presented to the jury, they soon came back with a verdict. Just a few weeks later on the 1st of December, a jury voted 10 to 2 that Joseph Smith should be executed by lethal injection. Joseph asked the judge to spare him for the sake of his family. However, on the 15th of March the following year, the judge officially sentenced Joseph Smith to death for his crimes. Carly endured unspeakable trauma, which began at the time of her kidnapping. The image of the defendant taking her arm and leading her away no doubt will forever be etched in our minds. At 11 years of age, there is no doubt she was aware of her dire predicament and that she had little or no hope of survival. Her death was consciousless and pitiless, calculated and premeditated. Joseph Smith, based on your actions, you have forfeited your right to live freely among us. May God have mercy on your soul. After the death penalty was reached by the jury, Joseph offered a statement that said in part, I want you to know that I take full responsibility for the crimes. I don't know how this all happened. I was very angry at myself and very high. I knew that getting high was wrong, but I could not stop. I'm not trying to make excuses for what happened, but I really don't remember much about anything on that day. Following his death sentence, Carly's stepfather Stephen said afterwards, I thought I'd feel a lot different, but it still hurts. It doesn't change anything. I just feel that Carly has been heard. Her soul is gone now. Now it's a matter of time to wait to watch Joe Smith die. Carly's mother was not in court for the sentencing as she was being held in prison on prostitution and drugs charges. She said that she had turned to drugs to numb the agony of losing Carly. After being sent to death row, he would launch several appeals against his sentence. None of his appeals had so far been successful, but everything would soon change. The defendant is guilty of murder in the first Smith was charge. sentenced to death but this week a circuit judge ordered that he be given a new sentencing trial. This all stems from a recent Supreme Court ruling requiring juries to be unanimous when sentencing someone to death. I, I don't feel it has anything to do about justice or the law. Carly's father, Joe Brucia, is furious. They're, they seem indifferent to the victims and their families. They think they can just do these things without affecting people, but it affects people a lot. He does not deserve to live on the um, taxpayer's expense any longer. Joe Brucia and his family are writing letters asking the governor and the attorney general to step in. Do the right thing. Do what the state of Florida promised my family and I, and that is to put Joseph Smith to death. And that's, uh, he killed my daughter. In 2016, the U.S. Supreme Court declared the Florida law unconstitutional since the death penalty could be imposed without a unanimous jury verdict. In 2018, the Florida Supreme Court also dropped Smith's death sentence. It was reinstated in 2020. Now, nearly a year later, the Florida Supreme Court has ordered a new sentencing hearing for Smith. A circuit court will only consider Smith's sentence and not his conviction. A hearing date has yet to be set. I'll lend you for a little while a child of mine, God said. Don Betts. To me, it's just a nice place to, uh, to spend some of my uh, time. Thinks about Carly Bruscia more than most. But they found it was, was right on the edge of the, uh, just about where this rock is. He's the caretaker of her memorial at the Central Church of Christ. He comes here to reflect about Bruscia, and he remembers his own granddaughter, who was murdered years ago. But when you lose someone, a family member, it's, uh, it's just nice to have a place to go sit and, and enjoy the uh, solitude. He's unsure what to think of the news that Bruscia's killer, Joseph Smith, is going to be resentenced. I have real mixed feelings about it. Another life taken uh, doesn't bring Carly back, but at the same time, uh, like I say, um, justice should be carried out to whatever extent of the law. Joe was very critical of the justice system saying, I feel so let down by the system because Joseph Smith was on parole before he got to my daughter and he was supposed to go back to jail for five years if he violated. He did violate. He was, quote, passed out with a bag of cocaine in a parking lot. Instead of them giving him the consequence that they said they would, they gave him drug offender probation, which is just semantics. And that's why my daughter's not here today. Then they dragged this thing on from 2005 to 2021 and still going and it's not even done yet. So I have a lot of venom and disdain for the criminal justice system. 
After browsing the internet, Joe realised that he wasn't the only parent grieving a child who had been allegedly killed by someone on parole or probation. He said he realised this was actually a nationwide problem. Joe contacted a representative, Catherine Harris, and asked her to do something so that Carly's death would not be in vain and no more parents would have to go through something similar. Catherine Harris later introduced legislation named Carly's Law. She said at a press conference, we must act now to protect our children from the criminal repeat offenders who would use society's second chance to commit more acts of violence. Representative Nick Lamson from Texas was a co-sponsor for the bill and said, while we cannot prevent these events, we are obliged to respond and to help protect our communities. The law would take federal felons back into custody if they were to commit another felony offence, an offence intending to result in sexual contact with someone under the age of 16 or a crime of violence. It was also going to add a year-long extension to the Amber Alert grants, which helps issue alerts about abducted and at-risk children. Due to the cost that the new bill would likely incur, it was met with some pushback, with the state's top prison official saying it would cost nearly $1 billion dollars to put those that had criminal records like Joseph Smith back in custody. Joe said in response to this, I find it very offensive that they say it costs too much money. No one has the right to put a price on my daughter's head or any other child's. Carly's law initially didn't pass due to there not being enough time, but Representative Harris said she was going to reintroduce it and expand its scope. The meat of this is still going to be the meat of Carly's law, but the expansion would be to make sure we are closing other gaps on the exploitation of children. There is nothing more traumatic than a child being exploited or murdered. Everyone suffered greatly when Carly's death occurred, so we just want to make certain that scenario won't happen again. Despite this, Carly's law was not reintroduced. It's hard to believe 10 years ago this week, a little Sarasota girl was abducted at a car wash, sparking a search that captured the Gone attention of the entire forgotten. country. Gone but not forgotten. 10 years ago today, the world witnessed a kidnapping caught on tape. Carly Bruscia would be found days later murdered. She was only 11. Her body left behind a church. And now, a decade later, that church still honors that little girl by trying to protect other children. Such a tragic to Carly, but it's helped a lot of the other kids now. Stephen Kanzler, Carly Bruscia's stepfather, addressing the large crowd gathered at the Central Church of Christ. Her mother, Susan Shorpin, too emotional to speak at the place her daughter's body was found four days after her abduction. Hopefully it made aware, kids aware and adults aware. You know, it, it can happen to you. You know, you hear about it being somewhere else. You never think it'll happen here in your backyard. The massive search and the tragic discovery, hard to forget, even for seasoned officers who attended the memorial. For something like this to happen to her, um, I think it is probably our worst nightmare. But it's also uh, gave us that sense of uh, uh, vigilance. And uh, that's what I think really drove us all together to try to... Uh, bring him to justice. Smith sits on death row, but in the past 10 years, the church has worked with the community, sponsoring eight kid safety rallies, among other campaigns, all in memory of a little girl gone too soon. We're going to keep Carly's memory alive. This will always be a place in this community where you can come, where you can remember, and where you can recommit yourself to taking care of the kids in our community. Bradenton Police Department Assistant Chief Paul McWade later confirmed that Joseph Smith was also now a suspect in another murder, the murder of 25-year-old Tara Riley. He added he intended to have officers talk to him about it while he was on death row. In March 2000, Tara Riley's naked body was found in a retention pond behind a Walmart in Florida. Tips had come in, but there was nothing concrete. She had been seen arguing in the parking lot with someone, and two years after her murder, the police did question someone that matched the description but there was not enough evidence to file charges. Before long, her case would go cold and her files would gather dust, any hope of catching her killer fading more and more as the years passed. Six years later, though, in a recorded phone call, her name would resurface. As Joseph sat in prison, he had a call with his brother and mother. They were asking him a series of questions. One of them was, did they ask about Tara? Joseph's brother John actually knew Tara Riley. The two had worked together. He said that just before her death, she had turned Joseph down, and this humiliation, he believed, was the motivation for killing her. John said, I'm glad that story put a kick in the authorities' butts to do something about Tara. She was a sweet girl, she had a long life ahead of her, way too early to depart this earth. I hope they solve this murder before my brother dies. He added that he believed his brother was responsible for her murder. 17 years after Carly's abduction and murder, there was a breaking news announcement. 
55-year-old Joseph Smith had died at the Union Correctional Institution on the 26th of July 2021. His cause of death was not immediately announced, but it was later reported that he had died as the result of liver cancer, but other sources said it was after contracting hepatitis C. The Florida State Attorney's Office said in a statement, While nothing can bring back Carly, we are grateful that her family, her friends, and the entire Sarasota community will finally have closure and will not have to endure any further court proceedings to bring him to justice. Carly's father said he felt wonderful when he heard that Joseph had died. It's long overdue. The inept and corrupt criminal justice system could not get it done, so the natural order of things finally took care of it, he said. Joseph Smith was never charged in connection with Tara Riley's murder, and her case remains unsolved. The truth about his potential involvement with other crimes, including hers, will now likely never be known. John said he wished his brother had confessed. He never truly confessed, I don't think, about Carly, and he definitely didn't confess about Tara. He died a coward. That's all. Now, loved ones are reaching out to us again, pleading for your help to restore this garden that you see right over there. It's dying. People are forgetting. At one time, dozens of volunteers came every week to care for the memorial garden for 11-year-old Carly Brucia. Now it's neglected and vandalized. Family friend Sherry Langworthy, she and her husband, along with Carly's cousin, have worked the last three weeks trying to restore the garden. I want her legacy, her, her memory to live on, and um, I, I, want, I want it to... Sh um, be kind of like an awareness thing, you know, for parents to take their kids here and teach them, you know, what can happen. Local volunteers and businesses help to maintain the garden. The impact of the murder of Carly Brucia was far reaching and long lasting. For her devastated mother Susan, her life was never the same. We're learning that Susan Shorpin has passed away. Shorpin is the mother of Carly Bruchia. Yeah, Haley, over the years, a lot of folks have been saddened by Carly's death. Tonight, they are all grieving for her mom. Susan was a very, I believe, very dedicated mother, and she uh, loved her, her daughter very much. That's how Pastor Rod Myers of the Central Church of Christ is remembering Susan Shorpin. Died on Monday at the age of 47. Myers remembers one encounter with Shorpin very vividly. Susan and I and Sheriff Balkwell at the time um, all came out and we had, a, we had a prayer near where Carly was found and that was a very meaningful time to me. Carly Brucia was just 11 years old. She had so much to do and so much to see. A life of endless promise clearly lay ahead of her. She was someone who made people feel loved, always being sure to greet her friends with a big hug and a friendly smile. And it is through those happy memories that her spirit continues to live on and be with those who knew and loved her. As her father Joe said, my family and I, we talk about her and we have photos of her all around the house. She's in our hearts and minds all the time. For those of you that like to listen on the go, we now have our episodes in podcast form, and you can now find this via the link in our description box, or by searching Truly Criminal Podcast on your podcasting platforms. <laughs>